what we're going to ask Simon Walsh to do for us is to present a case uh, from Belfast so that we can think about the aspects of uh, treatment that this case uh, brings to us. And uh, you can be thinking about how you might treat that in your lab. And we can then discuss the data that might guide the decisions that we might make about how to make the best outcomes for our patients. So Simon, welcome, and we look forward to seeing the case. Okay. So 54, a slightly impaired ventricle, yeah. atrial fibrillation, a big patient. Ton of comorbidity. Um, yeah. And an acute presentation. Um, 20 mils to do a, a, a coronary angiogram, that's pretty good going. That's quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just let the guys work here. Yeah, no, how, much, I mean, how much CT do you use in Belfast? Uh, we use a, a moderate amount. Uh, principally, we use CT for TAVI planning and LA appendage and that sort of thing. Uh, for coronary, it's typically for low-risk patients. And uh, oh, success, yay. We're in business. <laughs> Triple. <laughs> uh, so we'll get to the, the pictures of the, the case. Um, so... Here we have a calcified right coronary artery with a mid-right lesion. Uh, he's got a CTO of his circumflex, and you can see some of the collaterals going across. So it does go to the proximal vessel, so it's relatively short. And here's his left coronary system as well. And that's, that's all you get. <laughs> um, is that a pressure wire, Simon? Nope. Uh, it was just to stabilize the guide. So the collaterals, you see the circ does fill quite proximally. I think there's continuity there between the proximal and distal circumflex. So the CTO itself is fairly short. His syntax score is 47.5, uh, so fairly high with left main and, and all the rest. And the syntax score, too, is this. So his anatomy is very much surgical, but the patient, of course, is not. So he, <clears throat> he was discussed at the heart team meeting, um, and the decision ultimately came towards PCI because of the lower risk of precipitating dialysis, and to try and get this man out of trouble uh, rather than putting him through bypass at that stage. And I'll leave it with you guys next. Just remind us the, the, the baseline creatinine, Simon. Uh, baseline creatinine was about 180. 180. So, perhaps we'll start with Margaret down the end there. Um, in Glasgow, um, this patient, what would be the pros and cons? So, um, I think our conclusion after our discussions would have been the same as Simon's described in Belfast. I think from a PCI point of view, um, you know, it's not the easiest case in the world, but it's by far not the most difficult case in the world, technically. The CTO is very short, and as Simon said, looks like there's continuity. The right doesn't look like it's going to be too problematic. And again, the left main LED, it's, it's the it's part of the discussion is going to be what you do with that bifurcation because it looks like there's quite a big calibre difference between the LED and the circumflex at the moment while the circ's slightly underfilled. So I think taking all the clinical aspects into consideration and looking at the anatomy, I would uh, we would have come to the same, the same conclusion. It's an interesting example of how using a small amount of contrast you can get a lot of information. Yeah. You saw how he let the camera run, he let the camera run, let the camera run, and we saw the circumflex occlusion, we saw everything we needed to know. When the inexperienced radiographer, uh, uh, physician, takes the same set of pictures in the same patient, uses 120 mils of contrast, and you still can't yeah. make any comment about the CTO occlusion in the circumflex because they came off the pedal far too early to actually get the information. I think it's really good practice, and anybody with significant renal impairment to do a four or five injection angiogram stop wait a couple of days and then bring them back, use the roadmaps from the first procedure for the second, and you can usually do both procedures with very little contrast. Can you come back to the angel, please? So that when, which, why which, we discuss, which vessel? okay, thank you. Well, the left, left coronary, so that while we, dis we are discussing, it's okay. So one of the questions that would always come up in <laughs> every time in Oxford is they say, is the LED significant? And the answer is always, if we put a pressure wire down, the answer will be yes. Um, but it always has a bearing. And, and I think that's the other thing which, you know, increasingly, you can see there's a discrete stenosis in that view, uh, which almost certainly means that there's ischemia in the LED territory. But making these decisions about surgery, no surgery, without knowing whether the LED is ischemic, you know, it, it's so difficult. Patrick, in syntax three, uh, the CT, where, where do you think the CT would have fitted in this patient? 
I think that CT will do a proper diagnosis of uh, the coronary anatomy. What is very important here is that uh, you have in syntax 2 a morbid, uh, mortality at four years of 5% for surgery, but that's the need of the human being and the heart team. There is many other component in this patient which is not reflected by a score. We just take the basic uh, uh, clinical characteristic and the uh, anatomy. So I think that the choice uh, is basically the choice of the surgeon, one who doesn't want to have that kind of individual on his table with all the possible uh, complication uh, of all the comorbidity. So the surgeon might like the vessels but doesn't like the patient. Exactly. Uh, Gennaro, you any? I think, I think that the main, main goal in these patients is to achieve a, a full revascularization. So complete revascular. Because the, uh, if the surgeons ref refuse the patients, and sometimes the patient refuse the, the surgeon, we must give to the patient the, the, the best treatment. In these cases, if the surgeon would uh, make a, a complete revascularization, we must do the same. Or we must try to do the same. Or demonstrate that some lesions that cannot be treated but we have to demonstrate with IFR or FFR that this is the real, uh, uh, real brilliant intuition of, uh, of, uh, of syntax 2. Is, is there point. an option for stage procedure to do oh, that in option. two phases to I think spare all, the kidney? Yeah. Uh, there, there, there always is, but I think what we are going to contrast that with is that kind of what I refer to as a cherry-picking approach from PCI, which is to say, I quite want to do that bit in the mid-LAD, and I might put a stent in the right, but that's all I'm really interested in, and then I'm going to run away. Well, I think it's a great point that the panel have made. And part of the MDM discussion and the heart team discussion was that complete revascularization by PCI was feasible and was the goal. So that was, we could offer equivalent revasc. Uh, do you want to operate in this manner or not? And the surgeons felt that he was very high risk. The, so ju just to mention the CTO, <clears throat> the uh, ejection fraction was impaired, but the lateral wall moved. So we assumed that the circumflex territory was viable. Uh, when you do do DFR and CTO, if you cross with the microcatheter, you get a, a value of 0 0.04, not 0 0.4. So there's your resting FFR. Uh, this patient had atrial fibrillation, which was running uh, fast. So actually getting a formal DFR is a little bit of uh, a problematic issue with the software. You can see we're trying to record it here, but his resting FFR is um, highly significant, um, somewhere between those two numbers. Uh, so there's the uh, resting FFR. So again, DFR, just, we couldn't capture it with five uh, continuous beats, but you know that is what it is. So excuse me, what do you call resting FFR? PDPA or yeah, PDPA. Oh, PDPA. Okay. Yeah. So highly significant. So I'll leave it with you guys and catch us up a little bit of time. Uh, Simon, in your experience, uh, uh, except beyond this case, uh, you you are used to make to check with FFR even if IFR is negative in your, in your daily practice, or when uh, IFR is is uh, significantly ne negative, you don't use any. When it when it's positive, I don't. Uh, when it's in the grey zone, I actually still follow the syntax too. When it's uh, negative, in the grey zone. Uh, in the point eight nine to nine three or eight six to nine three, I still do FFR because um, there is a twenty percent discordance. So, personally, I, I'm still learning with DFR, uh, but with IFR, I would still follow that uh, practice. So, uh, I think one of the most important things that we need to consider, um, well, the most important thing we need to consider is the patient. Um, so, this particular patient, uh, we're very very cautious about his kidneys. So we made sure that he was off anything that was potentially nephrotoxic for at least 48 hours. We set him up with the renal guard system as well. Uh, and the plan was to use a single right radial artery uh, approach with minimization of contrast during the procedure. Uh, any comments from you guys on the panel or from the room? <coughs> I presume everybody would do something similar. I think that this is a very important topic, uh, obviously, I mean, and, and, and it's great that you started by centering the, the, the PCI in the patient and how to protect this. Um, will you, uh, do you have any particular imaging techniques that will help you in minimizing your acquiring? For example, do you have uh, then 
coronary growth mapping or like uh, we don't at home but uh, i mean we use hd ivis and we do the poor man's roadmap which is basically to mark the distal landing zone mark the proximal landing zone with fluoro stores and uh, and so on so i mean ivis basically facilitates minimal contrast in this type of case. Would, would any any of the colleagues in the audience or in the panel have something to add to this list uh, of uh, preparation of the patient uh, that uh, you have presented? Not, not so much in the preparation, but uh, we used to do this case in the biplane room, have one scene film and then uh, replay and replay and replay and advance the guide wire without further injection, advise the IVUS without further injection. Uh, there have been cases who have been done in biplane uh, with just the 12 ml because you were guessing where is the lesion, putting the stand where it is, just by playing biplane and looking at the video continuously. Can okay. be done. And can another done. another <coughs> option, Patrick, is actually to mark the coronaries with multiple guide wires. Mm -hmm. So you can use them as your, uh, yeah. as your angiographic marker, if you like, um, as well. Beyond, beyond the renal guard, that is uh, obviously the gold standard, we don't have renal guard, but we have a, a, a small device that is uh, with two plastic uh, tube that is can, you can gain about 25% of dye in any, in any uh, uh, angio or in any patient, and uh, that is very, it's very easy to use. Ob obviously, it's not like a renal guard because you, you don't leave this device but it's only on the on the table but you can uh, spare about 20 25 percent you can it can help you yeah that has got some nice series hasn't he of uh, using ivis and physiology uh, so very little uh, contrast in, in complex disease using the combination of uh, physiology to know that you've got a good result yeah. distally and intravascular ultrasound and, and then that's and that's quite uh, cool well my plan very much was Ivis guidance uh, to minimize contrast and if I didn't get this case done with uh, less than 100 mils I was potentially going to shoot myself in the head. Uh, anyway. a, very, a very simple practical thing is to m make sure you can slave your previous angiogram into your your monitors because in some systems you in some labs you can't do that so if you've got the diagnostic shots have them up and you don't even need to take any baseline pictures you've got the pictures from the diagnostic angiogram so it's uh, patient preparation it's lab preparation in order to then put yourself in a position to do the full case and to get the best result so you'll remember that the hd ivis didn't cross the lesion and this is the pre-dilation balloon also not crossing the lesion it's heavily calcified uh, clearly on fluoroscopy and uh, without contrast so what's the next step? We'll take the uh, rot the new rotational atherectomy machine, please. <laughs> Would anybody go to a small balloon and try to make a small space and upsize it or mess I mean, around? One possibility, I mean, nowadays uh, you go prepared to these cases with an extension catheter, typically. So um, I think that probably they will have it already in place. But uh. yeah. Well, we have a, a, a seven French Amplatz guide and reasonable support, but equipment won't cross. So Adrian's quite right. I was asked for a unicorn case, which included rotational atherectomy, calcium, IVUS, physiology, and a CTO. <laughs> so <laughs> here it is. And I, I think this, this uh, algorithmic approach to calcium modification is quite important, and also to make sensible choices based on imaging. So whether it's OCT or whether it's IVUS, if you don't have the pre-PCI uh, uh, information, you don't know which modality to use and you're potentially spending an awful lot of money for not a lot of benefit. If you don't have, for example, concentric calcification, uh, lithotripsy is less effective, for example. So you've got to apply this sort of stuff with sense. So this is just a 1.5 millimeter burr. Um, you can see a pecking motion. We've got the Roto Pro system, which is a single operator device. Very nice, no foot pedals. You, you can do uh, everything yourself, basically. Uh, and a, a fair bit of effort required to get the burr across the lesion. And interestingly, Simon, that point at which the burr sticks was a different point to where the device was sticking. It's quite common that, isn't it? You know, it, it, the whole segment needs doing. You know, it's not just one little spot generally. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> guide catheter extension, guidezilla required to deliver a 4048 millimeter synergy stent, uh, which passes in fairly straightforwardly. Uh, Simon, what do you think about the step-up bar to start with the 1.25 and then to increase? 
Uh, I think, I mean, 90-something percent of our bears would be 1.5 to start. Um, so that would be, uh, you know, a, a cost-saving measure to some yeah, degree. Of so yeah. for me, rather than using two, if I can use one, that's better. Uh, I'll often take a seven French and like a two over and a left main, for example. So I try to take something that's appropriate to make sure I modify the lesion. But I base that um, generally on imaging if I can uh, as well. Okay, so stents in place. Uh, we implant the stent and we basically use IVUS uh, as soon as it's implanted to then optimize. So here's our distal edge. So we've no dissection, we've got reasonable stent expansion and good apposition. And proximally, actually we had to make it 5 uh, And again, no dissection and a well-expanded and well-opposed stent. A little bit of disruption in the mid-vessel as we've straightened it out and rotoblated. It is what it is, but a good result. The MLA, or MSA rather, is over 9mm squared. So I think that that reach to noses would be pretty disappointed. So you did all this uh, without contrast and you just uh, make a final injection, is that correct? That's correct. And basically we'd use 30 mils at this point because we'd done diagnostic images for you guys. Um, and uh, we'd, we'd got to this point with 30 mils of contrast. Very nice. So the circumflex. Uh, we've said already that we assume it's viable. Uh, and we have ipsilateral left to left collaterals. Uh, I would always teach where it's feasible that you should do contralateral imaging and understand where the distal target vessel is and uh, where, you know, make sure that your CTO procedure is safe. But we saw earlier that the right coronary artery fills the circumflex very proximally. So this is a short occlusion with a ton of calcium in the vessel. So we actually understand where the circumflex goes on the basis of the calcium. So what we're trying to do here is anti-grade wire escalation. Uh, and uh, get the, the vessel recanalized. And we had a discussion around whether to stage this type of procedure or not, and I think that's a great one. Um, and if you get to the point where you're not making progress, you can't see where you're going or it's difficult, uh, our plan was not to give a ton of contrast, but it was simply to stop and bring the patient back and do the circumflex at another stage. So we set ourselves a time limit, 15 to 20 minutes, Attempt anti-grade wire escalation, and if we're not successful, then we stop, fix the LED left main, and come back to the circumflex another day. One thing I think that's quite useful is the use of dual lumen catheters. So here we've got an angulated entry into the circumflex, and what the dual lumen catheter does is it provides you a great deal of stability, and if you're coming around a 90 degree bend on bench testing, uh, which Chad Kugler did when he was still at VSI, you'll increase the penetration force of your guide wire by approximately times three. So I think that's a useful thing to do. So here we've got a Sasuke device, uh, and we start in the standard fashion, some of the CTOs uh, you can get across with less uh, severe wires. So I actually attempted this with a fighter wire, which is one of the Boston Scientific Sentai wires, jacketed 1.5 gram taper tip, but no success, unfortunately, it kept bouncing off the proximal cap and going to a little small side branch. And a Gladius also did the same thing. So escalated to a Judo 6, which is a 6 gram wire, and it's built really to give uh, fine control at the tip with a little bit of flexibility in the lesion as well. And you can see here that the um, dual lumen catheter stabilizes our working position, but the wire is very, very torqueable and very controllable and actually crosses through the lesion into the distal true lumen. And that's just the, the Judo 6 wire, which is coming to a cath lab near you at some point, I presume. So after that, basically pre-dilate, and then we're going to stent the circumflex. So uh, we put in, on the basis of the IVUS, a 2.538 Synergy stent, which was in essence a DK mini crush, well, micro crush and almost a T stent. So there's our distal edge with no dissection and adequate sizing and good apposition. We kissed at the ostium, and that's what it looked like after the stent was deployed and kissed pulling back from the circumflex at the left main bifurcation. No contrast still. Left main LED. So we know that it's physiologically significant. So we're going to pre-dilate it because the calcium, as we've seen from the IVUS, is actually not concentric. It's all eccentric and at a maximum mark of 180 degrees. 
So it's a three millimeter balloon. And I think in the shockwave era that it makes sense to pre-dilate with one-to-one -one size balloons because you've got calcium modification in your back pocket if you can deliver equipment. And dissection really doesn't matter either with rotational atherectomy or with shockwave. So basically, single stent, 3048. We know that the left main is 50, so we do pot to 5. We post-dilate distally to 3.5 and then proximally and mid LED to 40. There's the distal edge, no dissection, we're happy. Good stent expansion in that position. And there's the left main stem after pot, again with good expansion and opposition uh, and no dissection at the proximal edge. Recross the circumflex, kiss, um, ivus everything, and make sure that we're happy. I did take a picture uh, for production, <laughs> uh, not because I needed to, uh, but for this uh, presentation really. And here's our circumflex ostium, which is greater than five millimeters squared. So it's not the most perfect uh, expansion in terms of its circularity, but it's good. And here's our LED and left main. End results in IVIS, MSAs, 5, 8 and 15. Procedure time is 90 minutes. Radiation dose is less than 2 gray in a very large patient. And contrast dose is 90 mils. What about the residual syntax score? We all know about the syntax score where you start. Well, actually, in this case, it's zero. And where does that leave him for the long term? Well, provided there's no restenosis, it leaves the patient actually in a very good place. Longer term plans, well, we've put Synergy stents in. We are very comfortable with the senior data. We've been using short DAPT uh, for our patients with very complex disease for a very long time. And we have published plenty of it as well. So his, his plan was short uh, uh, to transfer, get re-warfarinized uh, over a, a slow warfarinization, to have one month of DAPT with warfarin, and then to go with warfarin monotherapy. Do we need to look at his ischemia or his anatomy again? I'm not so sure. If he's well, I think leave him alone. So last thoughts from my own personal perspective. It isn't where you start, uh, particularly with the syntax score. It's actually where you finish. And if you can fully revascularize patients by PCI, they do extremely well. Uh, we put 70 patients into syntax too, and we're, we're glad to contribute to it. And I was grateful for the opportunity. But I think the results that Patrick has shown earlier are extremely reassuring for our patients. The last thing is, what are our standards for PCI? And if people can't do this, this particular type of case with this particular type of result, uh, should you be doing it at all? Or should you be referring it to your colleague? And I think we've got to set very stringent standards given our evidence base uh, in 2019. And I'll stop there.